Good morning and welcome and happy Thanksgiving to you. I am so glad that you are joining us in this time of worship as we give praise and glory and thanksgiving to God on this Thanksgiving day and in this service of worship. Thanksgiving is one of my most favorite times of the year. It's all about singing our praises to the Lord and remembering all the benefits and all the blessings that He has bestowed upon us during the course of our days and months and over this past year. And I'm so glad that you're joining me in heart and mind and spirit to raise up your soul and your singing and praises to Him who loves us with an everlasting love. As always, and as has become a custom here at St. Mark Lutheran Church, we begin with this uh, very special word of the first proclamation to celebrate Thanksgiving Day. I'd like to share with you the proclamation made by Governor Bradford of Massachusetts for the first Thanksgiving in 1623, three years after the Pilgrims settled at Plymouth. Hear ye, hear ye, all ye citizens of Plymouth. Inasmuch as the Great Father has given us this year an abundant harvest of Indian corn, wheat, peas, beans, squashes, and garden vegetables, and had made the forest to abound with game and the sea with fish and clam, and inasmuch as he has protected us from the ravages of the savages, has spared us from pestilence and disease, has granted us freedom to worship God according to the dictates of our own conscience. Now I, your magistrate, do proclaim that all the pilgrims with your wives and your little ones do gather at the meeting house on the hill between the hours of 9 and 12 in the daytime on Thursday, November 29th of the year of our Lord, 1,623, and the third year since the pilgrims landed on the Pilgrim Rock there to listen to the pastor and to render thanksgiving to the Almighty God for all of his blessings. William Bradford, the governor of the colony. to sing my great Redeemer is praised the glories of my God and King the triumphs of His grace If eloquence I could display and every
face to face I see the splendid beauty of the Son, the one who died for me. We die for us, church. You believe it tonight? Come on, let's sing together. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Join me in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord, and to sing praises unto His name, the Most High. Let us come now before His presence with thanksgiving, and make a joyful noise unto Him with songs. Enter His gates with thanksgiving, and His courts with praise, be thankful unto him, and bless his name. Give thanks always for all things unto God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever. Our first reading for this Thanksgiving Day is from the Old Testament book of First Chronicles, the 29th chapter. Therefore David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. But who am I, and what is my people, that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you, and of your own have we given you. Here ends the reading. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel for Thanksgiving Day is taken from Matthew, the sixth chapter. Jesus said, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, 
which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself, sufficient for the day and its own trouble. Here ends the reading. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God, and praise be to Jesus Christ. Amen. Our responsive Thanksgiving psalm is uh, taken from selected verses from Psalm 145. I will proclaim, proclaim your greatness, my God and King. I will thank you forever and ever. Every day I thank you. I will praise you forever and ever. What you have done will be praised from one generation to the next. They will proclaim your mighty acts. They will speak of your glory and majesty. I will meditate on your wonderful deeds. They will tell about your goodness and sing about your kindness. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. All you have made will praise you, O Lord, and your people will give you thanks. God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy
Our Thanksgiving Day message is built around a series of statements of faith, moving on to a brief story vignette, and a hymn or a song. There are three sections in total. Each one of them will focus on one of the persons of our awesome and mighty triune God and the wondrous work that each does in our behalf. Part one, we praise you, O God, our creator, for your provision and care. Join me now as we confess our faith concerning God as our creator. I believe that God has created me and all that exists. He has given me and still preserves my body and soul with all their powers. He provides me with food and clothing, home and family, daily work and all I need from day to day. God also protects me in times of danger and guards me from every evil. All this he does out of fatherly divine goodness and mercy, though I do not deserve it. Therefore, I surely ought to thank and praise, serve, and obey him. Our first story is about a man who tried to weigh a prayer. He owned a little grocery store. It was the week before Christmas, shortly after World War I. A very tired-looking woman came into the store and asked for enough food to make a Christmas dinner for herself and her children. The grocer asked her how much money she could afford, how much she could, we, she, could she spend. And she replied by saying, well, my husband did not come back. He was killed in the war. And I have nothing to offer you but a little prayer, she answered. The storekeeper was not very sentimental, nor religious. So he said, half mockingly, well, write that prayer on a piece of paper and I will weigh it. I'll put as much food on the one side of the scale as the weight of the prayer on the other side. Now, to his surprise, the woman took out a piece of paper from her pocket and handed it to the man saying, I already wrote it out during the night while watching over my sick baby. Well, the grocer took the piece of paper before he could recover from his surprise and because there were other customers watching and who had heard his remarks, he placed the unread prayer on the side of the old-fashioned scale to see what it would weigh. And then he began piling food on the other side. And much to his amazement, the scale would not go down. He became a little bit angry and flustered and finally said, well, that's all the scale is going to hold. Here's a bag. You'll have to put the food in it yourself. I'm busy. And he moved on. With trembling hands, the woman filled the bag and through moist eyes expressed her gratitude and then left the store. After the store was empty of all the customers, the grocer tried to figure out what had happened. And so he began to examine the scale, and yes, he determined that it was broken. And it had broken just before the woman came in, and just in time for God to answer the prayer of that woman. But as the years passed, the grocer often wondered about the incident. Why did the woman come in just at that right time? Why was she already prepared, having written down the prayer to hand to them, and to do so in such a way that would kind of confuse him so that he would not examine the scale before he weighed out the food? The grocer is an old man now, but the weight of the paper still lingers with him. He never saw the woman again, nor had seen her before that day. Yet he remembers her more than any of his customers he'd ever served. And he treasures that little slip of paper upon which that woman's prayer had been written. It contains simple words that came from a heart of faith. And it read, Please, Lord, give us this day 
our daily bread. Does God answer our prayers in such unusual or even unique ways? Yes. The Apostle Paul records for us one of the many promises that God has given to us about giving us our daily bread. He wrote, And it is God who will supply all your needs from the riches in glory because of what Christ Jesus has done for us. Who can begin to fully understand how vast and valuable are the glorious riches of Christ? And who can fully understand how great the Father's love is for us, that He would go to such lengths to give us our daily bread? You know, you and I have become the dearly loved children of God through a purchase and acquisition. God paid a great price for you and me to make us His very own. That purchase was paid not with gold or silver, but with the holy, precious blood and innocent suffering and death of Jesus Christ. And therefore, we are God's possessions. We are members of His flock. He meets all our needs just at the right time. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. So therefore, we thank and praise you, O God, our Creator, for your provision and your care. Join your voice now in singing this hymn.
this life brings suffering, Lord, I will remember what Calvary has bought for me. Part 2. We praise you, O God, our Redeemer, for your mercy and sacrifice. Join me now in the confession of faith in God our Redeemer. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, Son of the Father from eternity, and true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. He has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, Save me at great cost from sin, death, and the power of the devil, not with silver or gold, but with his holy, precious blood and his innocent suffering and death. All this he has done, that I may be his own, live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he is risen from the dead and lives and rules eternally." Congressman Steve Largent, yes, uh, that one-time superstar NFL wide receiver of the Seattle Seahawks, who was elected to the United States House of Representatives in 1994, tells a story about walking one February morning across the street from his office building in Washington, D.C. to the Capitol building. As he was going, he noticed a crowd of Secret Service men on the curbside. When he asked them what was going on, he was told that the King of Morocco, King Hussein II, was meeting the president that day. That day, even congressmen and congresswomen needed to have special permission to enter the Capitol building because the king had such a large procession of people that traveled with him wherever he would go. Interestingly, among the king's entourage, 
who was with him that day, was the king's personal heart donor. Yes, let me say that again. The king's personal heart donor. A person, an individual, who had been tissue-typed and determined to be a perfect organ donor match for the king. And therefore, should anything happen to the king, heart failure, kidney failure, liver failure, this person was right there, ready to make the donation. It is the man's responsibility to utterly lay down his life for the king of Morocco if he is needing a heart or a liver or whatever. That is his life mission. Can you imagine taking on such a job? Well, Jesus laid down his life for us. He gave not just his heart, but his whole being. It was his life mission, you see. The Father, knowing we would be infected by the terminal disease of sin, designed a plan to cure us of sin and to take us off the pathway leading to our spiritual death and to give us a true and real life. And so God sent His Son, Jesus, into the world in order to become the means by which our sins are forgiven. Christ went not to the Capitol in Washington, D.C., but to a hill called Calvary outside Jerusalem. And He died there for the sins of the whole world, including yours and mine. We need that. The whole world needs that. And Christ's death effectively removes our sins and their consequences from the record and the account of our lives as far as the east is from the west. Jesus Christ took care of the one big problem that would have kept us out of heaven, would have forever put us at odds and on the outs with God, and would have left us under the curse of sin and eternal death. The king of Morocco had a personal organ donor who was committed to give him whatever he needed. And yet in July of 1999, King Hussan II died of pneumonia. It was an illness for which there was no organ donation or replacement that could have helped. But Christ's offering of his life has removed the curse of death once and for all. And with the power that brought Christ back from the dead, he promised to all who would place their hope and trust in his cure, in his person and what he did, they will live forever. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall have everlasting life. And therefore, we praise you, O God, our Redeemer, for your mercy and sacrifice. Join your voices with mine now in this next song.
Part three, we praise you, O God, our sanctifier, for your guidance, strength, and the hope of heaven. Join your voice now with mine in the confession of faith in God, our sanctifier. I believe that I cannot by my own understanding or effort believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel enlightened me with his gifts, and sanctified and kept me in the true faith. In the same way, he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it united with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, day after day, he fully forgives my sins and the sins of all believers. On the last day, he will raise me and all the dead, and give me and all believers in Christ eternal life. Pastor Ron Mill, in his book that is titled Surprise Endings, tells the story of an old sea captain named Eliezer Hall, who lived in Bedford, Massachusetts, during the time of the great sailing ships. He was renowned, he was legendary and revered as the most successful of all sea captains of that day. He worked harder, stayed out longer, and lost fewer men while catching more fish than any other. Captain Hall was often asked about his uncanny ability to stay out so long without navigational equipment. He once had been gone for two years without coming home for a point of reference. And Eliezer simply replied, Oh, I just go up on deck and listen to the wind and the riggings. I get the drift of the sea. I look up at the stars. And then I set my course. Well, times changed at Bedford. The big insurance companies moved in and said they no longer insured the ships if the captains didn't have a certified and properly trained navigator on board. They were terrified to tell Eliezer, but to their amazement, to their astonishment, he said, eh, if I must, I will go and take the navigational course. So Eliezer graduated, high in his class, by the way, and having greatly missed the sea, he immediately took off for a long voyage. On the day of his return, the whole town turned out to ask him the, the question that they were just needing an answer to. Eleazar, how was it having to navigate with all those charts and equations? Well, Eleazar just sat back and let out a, a long sigh and a little bit of a low whistle. And he said... Oh, well, it was really quite simple. Whenever I wanted to know my location, I would go down into my cabin, get out my charts and the tables, and I'd work out all the equations, and I'd set my course with scientific precision. And then I'd go up on deck and listen to the wind and the riggings and get the drift of the sea and look up at the stars and go back down and correct the errors that I had made in my computation. Pastor Mill, when he heard this story, he prayed, he said to himself, Oh Lord, <laughs> I want to know you that way. I want you to be up there on deck, and I want to come up and I want to hear your quiet voice speak to me in my heart. I want to consider your eternal word, and then I want to go back down and I want to make adjustments to all the fine, logical, scientific plans that I've drawn up in my head. Proverbs 16, verse 9 says, A man's heart plans his course, 
but the Lord determines his steps. And Psalm 8 at verse 32 says, The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. And how does God guide us? How does he guide you, advise you, watch over you? Well, by his word and by his Holy Spirit. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 119, Your word, O Lord, is a lamp unto my path. It's a guide to my feet. And Jesus himself once said, When the Spirit of truth comes that I will send, he will guide you in all the truth that I've given to you. You know, we live in very uncertain times, and none of us knows exactly what the future holds and what it will bring to us. But our Heavenly Father promises to guide us, advise us by His Word and Spirit on the best pathway for your life and mine. So trust Him. This is the way He watches over you. And therefore, we praise you, O God, our sanctifier, for your guidance and strength and for the hope of heaven. Join your voice now in our next song, Give Thanks. Let us pray to the Lord with thanksgiving in our hearts 
for all His blessings and trust in His mercy to answer all of our prayers. For the richness of your creation and for the grace that sustains what you have made, for the bounty of resources that sustain our daily lives, and for the good fruits of the earth by which we and all creatures are fed and nourished, we give you thanks, O Lord, for your sovereign rule and preservation that protects us against harm and danger and guides us in the way of goodness and which is pleasing to you and for the gospel by which we hear of forgiveness of our sins and life everlasting, and for the courage to share that blessed gospel with those who do not yet know you, O Lord, we thank you. For the government and order in our land and in our world, and for those who lead us in this nation, and for all leaders of all the nations, And for the blessing that comes by their hand of justice and peace and the promotion of respect and goodwill toward all, we thank you and praise you, O Lord, for our life together as your people in this church and with the church throughout the world and for the care and the Christian charity that we receive from our fellow members of the body of Christ and for our unity and love and in the Holy Spirit, We thank and praise you, O Lord. For those who are suffering illnesses of body or mind, for those who are sorrowing over the loss of a loved one, for those who are creeping near the door of death and the gateway to life, and for all of our family and friends and neighbors and fellow citizens and saints, that you will bestow upon them your common and uncommon healing, strength and comfort, Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer for thankful hearts that we may not forget the poor and those in need, for generosity that we may supply from our abundance those in want, and for the tithes and the offerings that we bring to you in gratitude for having lavished them first upon us, we thank and praise you, O Lord. In faithful remembrance of the saints who went before us, for grace to rejoice in the mercies the Lord showed them in their lifetimes, and for the promised day of a reunion in heaven one day, when we too shall be raised up in order to join them in the everlasting life, we thank you and praise you, O Lord. And in all things, O Lord, grant to us grace, not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought, but to honor you above all, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. On our own we have nothing that will endure, but you have granted to us all things in Christ, and the life that does not end. Hear your people for the sake and in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, with whom and in whom and through whom all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now according to his promise, and as he has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive now this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his good favor and keep you in his peace. Amen.